Today's episode of 18th Century Cooking with James Townsend and Son is a little different. Obviously, we're outside and not in the German kitchen. But even more significantly, today I'm being joined by a special guest, Michael Dragu. Welcome, Michael. Thank you, sir. It's my pleasure. Michael is a historical reenactor, or as he likes to put it, a living history demonstrator who purposefully puts cooking or demonstrating 18th century food ways into his historical reenactment routine. Together over the next few episodes, Michael will be sharing some of his favorite dishes, as well as some reasons why you should consider adding period cooking into your historical routine. Thanks for joining us today on 18th Century Cooking with James Townsend and Son. Michael, before we begin cooking today, uh, I want our viewers to get a chance to know you better. Uh, you've been to our store uh, many times in Pearson, and frankly, it's your, your passion and enthusiasm for reenacting that's, that's got us interested in. And uh, how long have you and your wife been doing a historical reenacting? Just a little over two years. So you're a bit of a neophyte at this. Absolutely. What sort of uh, historical time period and persona do you do? You do? Oh, it's uh, French and Indian War up, up until Revolution, 1750s to 1780s. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of persona? Um, I haven't developed that yet. It's just the 92% of the population who were farmers. Mm -hmm. And what we try to do if we're in Western Virginia is research what would have been available at that time of sure, year sure. there versus Ohio or Michigan or Tennessee. Right. So that's, that's we just... What so a lower been? class Absolutely. kind of time frame? Or Not time? looking shabby right. like I just struggle out of the woods, but just right. trying to make it through the next year. Right. And what would I have had as a typical meal? And and a uh, area specific. We try. Which yes. is very which varies a lot from Absolutely. one place to another. Absolutely, yeah. yes. Berries that are in season in Michigan might right. ma might be passed. So in, time in the South. and location. I try to do what if you were there today in my time, what right. what I've been working with. So, Michael, most reenactors uh, choose uh, trades or battles or specific soldiers to do, but you focus on 18th century foodways. Yep. What led you to that decision? You know, Deb and I, as the public, as members of the public, would go to these different events, and we'd see a lot of people making noise and making smoke or coming out of the woods, and, and we just wanted to do something different. And we didn't see a lot of people just being everyday people. And, and we like to cook. And the few times we saw people demonstrating cooking, sometimes you were seeing things that obviously would be more toward the Civil War, porcelain mm -hmm. plates or things right. like that. And we thought, well, heck, we could do that. We could do that. And we just looked at each other and said, let's try it. And that's exactly how it happened. So, Michael, you've told us, you know, why you do cooking in reenactments, but why do you choose historical reenactment itself? When we would go on vacation when I was little, um, our families would go to... Um, Michelin-Mackinac or Boonesboro or any place like that. We'd always stop at a fort. My long-suffering mother would go along with us and, and tour the forts. But so many people spent time to talk to me as a kid, as the age of your youngest child, um, and, and, and make sure that I was understanding what they were doing and why. And I, that, that just made an impression on me. And, mm -hmm. and we chose food because we didn't see other people doing food today. And, and we liked to cook. Uh, but what I'm trying to pass on is that passion to just pass, you know, get these people to, to get a little more out of it than just seeing flashes and, and smoke. And cooking is a good way to engage well, with the public. Everyone cooks. Yeah. I'm just showing them what they would have done instead of tonight's supper at home, right. what my tonight's supper would have been 250 years ago. Sure. Yeah. So how, how do you engage the public directly? You know, when we look through all these old recipes, um, we, we try to choose things that are easy and short mm -hmm. so that I'm not just doing a five hour in the pot wonder that nobody can see happening. Right, right. We try to turn these things every half an hour to an hour. So um, th I've chosen three recipes that are either variations of things you've already shot videos on mm -hmm. or just simple things that anyone could do um, at, 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 during their reenactments or their demonstrations or whatever. Or they can uh, take these home with them and still do an easy, simple absolutely. thing. They can engage even with their own kids or whatever. Yep, and we I get the kids involved. I, I pick things. I don't let them do sharp things or hot things. but whether it's a grade school kid or a high school kid. Mm -hmm. I love 
uh, school days because they have such great questions and there's such an interest because they get to cook at home. Right. And so I let them help grind stuff or mince or um, um, grate stuff or mm. or just anything or like make that. Make butter. Do or my yeah. absolutely. Yeah, it's just fun. I never expected to enjoy that as much as I do, but I really like that interaction. It's just a connection that. And everybody loves food. So. Oh, no kidding. It's fun. Yeah. So what are we going to make today, Michael? Scots eggs or Scottish eggs or Scotch eggs. It's most commonly referred to. All the same to. thing. Yeah. Absolutely, yes. Okay, let's, let's make it. Let's Scotch eggs. All righty, I have minced up a half a pound of ham, mm -hmm. uh, finely with my knife. And what I'm going to do is uh, use this as just like a mortar and pestle. And once we have pulverized this so it's no longer looking like little crumbs, little squares of ham, we are going to add a quarter cup of breadcrumbs, right. some allspice and nutmeg to taste, mm -hmm. and salt and pepper to taste, and a well-beaten egg. So we're just going to throw that all in here. Okay. I'm going to sneak up on my salt because right. each cured ham is, has its different consistency of salt. I've got just a, I've got some green onion mince okay. because I like that in here. And um, we're going to get our egg in here. So just one egg yolk? Just one egg yolk, yes. Thank you, John. And I'm just going to mush this all up. So it's a nice patty consistency. If it's still a little dry, just add a little more egg. And what we're gonna do now is get a patty made up in one hand and a patty made up in the other hand. And then with your third hand. Yeah, my th with my third hand, we're gonna plop a hard boiled egg in there. Okay. We're gonna encompass it right in between there. I'm looking for about a half an inch of meat on this. So we're just gonna lay it in the pan. I've got some uh, some suet in here, and uh, the secret is to just be turning this frequently so it's not burning, and it's cooking to set the egg, because the egg is one of the binders. We're just going to keep rolling this slowly, and not burn my hand. Since this is ham, it doesn't need to have a whole lot of cooking. Right, on, I, I am just warming Since it and setting done. it, yeah. that's right. So I like the atora. I like using the atora because there's no there's no taste of the the animal fat. You know, with right. a lard or, or with butter and stuff, it butter burns more easily. Right. And the lard sometimes will you'll taste that. And I don't taste anything except Yeah, the suet has a high high cooking temperature. Yep. So it's, Yep, it's very forgiving for this right. when I can't really control the temperature perfectly. We're almost done here. I think I'm about ready to pull it out. And if I were prepared to have something to pull it out and put it on too. There you go. Here we go. Thank you, sir. That's it. Let me get my pan off here. We're going to let that cool just a little bit before we cut it. It helps it set a little bit. And that's just about it. Thank you, sir. These look great. I can't wait to see what they're going to look like on the inside. We'll, we'll find out, won't we? Let's we find will. out. <laughs> oh, yeah. Ah, Perfect. Yes. Okay, so we got them. We get a nice little presentation Very good. there. And the only sauce. thing that we would add is a little sauce here. And this sauce is? It's nothing but cream, a little roux, flour and butter. I added some pepper, a little salt, and some of the uh, uh, some uh, chicken stock. Okay. That's it. Go to it. Okay. It's, it's okay. You're you good. Got it here, here? Yep. And That's is it. Is that enough? Okay. That's perfect. That's very good. And it's not the flavor I was expecting out of it. I mean, you see this and you, you don't think a ham yep. um, ground up, so it definitely is a different flavor. I'm, I, can, I can't imagine anybody complaining about getting this for. If you'd like a copy of the recipe that we've done here today, make sure to check out our savoringthepast.net cooking blog. Also, all the things you've seen here today, all these things are available on our website. And if you don't have one, be sure to ask for our print catalog where you can find hundreds of 18th and early 19th century reproduction clothing items, camping supplies, as well as cooking products. And also be sure to visit our picture reference blog, siftingthepast.com, where you can find all sorts of paintings and illustrations from the 16th through the early 19th centuries. This recipe is really, really good. I think. Anybody who gives us a, a chance takes a little bit of extra effort, but it is very, very worth it. I want to thank you for bringing uh, this to us today. It's my pleasure. I'd thank you. Love to have you. Uh, I think this was a great opportunity. I want to thank all you 
for joining us uh, and watching today as we savor the flavors and the aromas of the 18th century. <laughs>